opportunity to, to be here tonight. What a great dinner that was. I want to thank Hank Smith for inviting me and for all of you for letting me come tonight. We're in a cultural war. It's about truth versus error and light versus darkness. And Hank is one of the generals in the cultural war. My name is Frank Simon. I'm a medical doctor. I want to tell you something that happened to me about 1970. There was a doctor here in Louisville named Dr. Carter, and his wife's name was Mary Rita. Does anybody know Dr. Carter? Well, he was quite a while back. When I first came to Louisville, I went into practice with my father. Dr. Carter sent me a patient, and you know, doctors do that. Some young doctor starts, they say, oh, I will give him a hand and refer a patient to him. So here's Dr. Carter comes along and gives me this patient. Says, you better admit him to the hospital down at St. Anthony's. Of course, St. Anthony's isn't even a hospital anymore, but that was back in those days. When I went to check on him, his stomach, when you put your hand on his stomach, it a concrete block in there. It's a big, hard, mass. And I thought to myself, well, this isn't good. I had a surgeon come by and see him, and he did a biopsy and came back cancer. It was my job to go and tell this gentleman that he had cancer. It turns out he was full of cancer. So I went to tell him, and I said, well, you know, the biopsy came back cancer. And he said, well, I thought it was, just like that, as though it was just like drinking a glass of water or something. And I said, I was surprised because he wasn't upset about it. And I said, well, you seem to have a, a different attitude than some people. And he said, well, I know I've got cancer and I'm dying. He says, but I'm ready. Wow. I never heard anyone talk like that before. And it kind of shocked me. So I said, what do you mean you're ready? He says, well, when I leave here, I'm going to a better place. <laughs> the minute he said that, there was like a voice inside of me that says, well, he may be going to a better place, but I'm going to a worse place. And sort of a fear came over me because all of a sudden I realized there was something real that this man had and I needed it. So I started going to different churches. I remember there was a brother, Kathy at the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. Ever heard of him? Well, I went to several churches. They didn't give an invitation, but Brother Kathy did. I didn't really understand what he was doing. I didn't understand it. But I started thinking about it. It doesn't matter really how much money I have. It doesn't really matter how many degrees I have. It doesn't really matter where I live. If I go out into eternity and I don't have what this man has, I've missed everything. I went around these different churches. Finally, I met Dr. Magruder. Has anyone heard of Dr. Magruder in Burnett Magruder? He's gone now, but he was quite a gentleman. He had a prayer meeting called GLEF, Greater Louisville Evangelical Fellowship. They'd meet every Saturday for a prayer meeting. Over there, I met another gentleman named Chester Stess. Has anyone heard of Chester Stess? No? The Methodist. And Brother Chester, you asked Brother Chester, he was the pastor at this mission church. Brother Chester, what did you used to do before you became the pastor here? And he would say, well, I was a drunk. He didn't say I was an alcoholic. He said, I was a drunk. So he said, well, Brother Chester, tell me about it. Well, he was walking along the street, and he came to a storefront mission. And there was a man in there singing a song. The song was, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. The man was singing the song, and boom, he stopped singing. He said, wait a minute, he says. This is not just a song. This is the story of my life right here. I found Jesus, and right now I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Well, Brother Chester heard him say that because somebody threw a, a switch in his mind, and he went into that mission. Here's the guy that says he was a drunk. Okay, he went into the mission. They had an altar call. It went up. Brother Chester knelt at the altar and received Jesus. And after that, he opened this mission. He kind of reproduced the situation that this man was in when he 
when Chester got saved. Brother Chester said, well, why don't you come down to our mission sometime? So I said, okay. So I went down there, and Brother Chester explained that Jesus suffered and died on the cross for my sin. In other words, Jesus didn't do anything wrong, but I did. He took my punishment for me. They gave an altar call, and I went forward and knelt and asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and change me from the inside out. That's what happened. I asked him to write my name in his book so that when the end of time came, I could go to heaven with the other Christian people. It wasn't too long after that I realized that there's a cultural war going on in America today. Okay, there are people that don't They just don't like God. So these are the people that took prayer out of our public schools, took the Ten Commandments out of our public schools, the Bible out of our public schools, creation science out of our public schools. About 1962, some people might say, oh, well, what difference does it make? I would say it makes a big difference because after... It was shortly after they took prayer and the Bible and the Ten Commandments and creation science out of our school that a number of bad things started happening. First of all, America used to have the best schools in the world. In other Mm -hmm. words, there's an organization that goes and picks out, get the best students out of every country, and they give them exams. America, for years, used to be the top in the world for schools, for academic achievement. When they took prayer and really took God out of our public schools, our academic achievement began to fall. Now we're 25th, which is almost the bottom. The other thing is the crime rate started going up. Now, there was a time when you left your house, you didn't lock the car or lock the door. You just went on and went downtown. Doesn't matter what time it was. You just went downtown and did whatever. And there, nobody would bother you. But those days are gone. And it happened, I would say, shortly after they took God out of our schools. Then, of course, the other thing is the drug problem. Now, when I was in school, there weren't any drugs at all. No one ever heard of marijuana. Never heard of it, but up to 50% of the young people today experiment with drugs. So that's become a huge problem. And uh, overdosing with heroin is one of the leading causes of death. So we've had a huge problem that way. The other thing is, in 1950, there were five sexually transmitted diseases. Now there's 30 and it's growing all the time. So I would like to suggest that when they took God out of our public schools, they indoctrinate our children with an alternate, what you might call it, a humanistic worldview, where there are very few in the way of absolutes. And they teach evolution. Okay, now there's a Bible verse here I'd like to tell you. This is the Psalm 19. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day there uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard, and their line is gone out all through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Okay, so it says it doesn't matter if you're in South Africa or China or South America, if you look up at the sky, there's a loudspeaker speaking, not sound, but it's saying to whoever looks up at the sky and says, I'm here, I made this. And there's another verse here in Romans. It says, Romans 1.20, For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that no one is without excuse. No one is has any excuse, let's put it that way. So, in other words, if we see a, a painting on the wall somewhere, some people say, well, somebody had to paint that. 
And if you look at your watch, you say, well, somebody had to make that watch. And if you look at this building, you say, well, somebody had to make this building. And if you look up in the sky and see the stars and the way they rotate around and the planets, and you say, well, there had to be an intelligent designer that made all of this thing and make it work. But then there are other people who'd say, well, no, now here's this painting over here. It made itself. The paint jumped out of the paint can and jumped on the paintbrush and jumped on the canvas and, oh, yeah, that, that painting painted itself. Of course, it took millions and millions of years, but it painted itself. And the same with the watch. There was a hurricane and went through a junkyard and boom, out comes a watch all by itself. No designer, no one put it together. It just happened that way. That's kind of ridiculous because things don't go together and create themselves even in millions of millions of years. So I saw a movie a couple of weeks ago. It was called Genesis. Did anyone see that or hear about it? Genesis was made by Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis and some other people. Well, they're the ones that made the Creation Museum. Have you ever been to the Creation Museum? Oh, God bless you. And they also have the Ark Encounter. Yeah. Well, he made all of that. He said in this movie, he says, you got a choice. You can either believe what God says about creation, or you can believe what man has to say about it. But it makes a huge difference who you believe. He says, on the one hand, we have no meaning, no value to life, no significance, no purpose, no hope, because everything has just happened by itself. There's no meaning to it, no purpose to it. And the people, like you and me, we're just here by accident. We don't have any reason for being here or purpose. They also say, in the beginning, there was nothing. And then nothing exploded. And then you had everything. Of course, it took millions and millions of years for that to happen. But see, that's not very convincing. Evolution says, well, chaos created order. Well, that doesn't make sense. The second law of thermodynamics says that order deteriorates down into chaos with time. But they say, oh, no, it went the other way. Then they say, non-life created life. Pasteur, in about 1850, he proved that life never comes from non-life. In other words, if you want something alive, you got to start with something alive and get it to go. Okay, so... In other words, they're saying blindness created vision and deafness created hearing. Well, see, that's that's not very convincing. Okay, so now they're saying, well, a lot of the problems we have in the world today are because of the failure of public education. Without God, they're teaching things. Who's paying for all this education? You and me. Okay, so they're they're forcing us to pay to teach our own children what we don't even believe ourselves. So they're saying that we have this problem. Now, a few years ago, I read something that says Florida and Mississippi and Louisiana have all put prayer back into their schools. I said, wow, that's good. And so we got the law that they passed in Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And we put it into, we tried to get it past Kentucky. Well, we tried three times and three years, and we didn't get very far. But then there was a, two miracles. Number one, we got a strong Christian governor. That was a miracle. And then we got what they call a flip the house. You know what I mean by that? The house had been controlled by the Democrats. For the last 90 plus years, and they needed about five more Republicans to take control of the House, and I think they got 28. It was just a miracle. Just like that, 
we got that bill passed. And now it was Senate Bill 17. Now the students can pray in Kentucky schools. They can engage in religious activities either silently or when they say grace over their food, they can talk about all of that. Religious expression and political viewpoints can be expressed to the same extent as non-religious talk. So they can have, like, Bible study before and after school. They can display political and religious messages on their clothing. Do they know it? Well, see, a lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. Okay, well, in order to pass this bill, we, Eileen, she and Nate helped us, and of course, all of us worked together, and we would go really all over the state, Paducah, Owensboro, Bowling Green, Lexington, Ashland, Northern Kentucky, and we'd have meetings just about like this, and we'd have a free meal, and we'd invite people, oh, come on over, and then we put out a petition. We are petition, petition people. Okay, and people would sign that petition, sign that petition. And like, if he signs it, guess what? We're going to give him two fresh copies for him to take home and get his church to sign it. People in his church that are interested to sign it. And everyone that signed it got extra petitions, and we worked and worked and worked for, over, I guess, at least three years or so. When we got through, with God's help, we had 100,000 people. 100,000 people that said, yeah, I want to see God back in our schools again. We asked all of those 100,000 people to call their state representatives. Do you all know the number? 1-800-372-7181, something like that. So they, one of those legislators said, I got more calls about prayer than any other thing I've ever gotten calls about. We tried to, we asked God to help us. So with God's help, we're going to keep trying to put God back in our schools. And like you say, a lot of people don't know. So the other thing we did, we put a call out to these 100,000 people and said, would you help us start these courses? Now we have these courses. We got three courses. One course is on American history, which is not allowed in the public schools. These were all put out by Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham, he made these. They're about creation science. Like I say, if you look at creation science today, you uh, modern science has pretty much disproven the theory of evolution. Okay, Darwin thought that a single cell organism was like a drop of oil or something. But really, there are a hundred machines in that simplest bacteria. This is the American history one. All of these courses have a couple, I think most all of them have two DVDs. So really, you just go in there and turn on the DVD, and that's the course. They teach it for themselves. And every student has a workbook. Then there's a teacher of the workbook. These are the teacher's workbooks. There's another one on biblical apologetics. In other words, why we believe that the Bible is true. Then American history. We've got a lady, Cindy, and she's calling all the time. So if you all, like, it can go in your Sunday school class. It can go into your homeschooling. It can go into the schools. It's just information that is being censored from our public schools right now about American history, creation science, and apologetics. So if anybody wants that, I'd be glad to. We'll give you copies. We, we bought the originals, and then they gave us permission to make copies, except the American history we, we had to buy, but they gave us a good price on all that. So we will definitely give you all of this stuff. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, I went to another movie. It's called Revive Us, I think it was. And it featured Kirk Cameron. Thank you. Kirk Cameron, in the course of the movie, he said, Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world. I said, oh, well, that's great. And then I got home and I started thinking, you know, everyone says Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. So I did a search on Google, said, 
fastest growing religion in the world. Boom, enter. Up comes 20 or more articles, and they all said Islam is the fastest growing religion. So then I thought again, I put in there, Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world. Boom, enter. Up comes this article right here. It's, it has pictures in it. We got some of these we can give them. Here's a million people at a revival down in Nigeria. Here's another million people at a revival in somewhere else in Africa. Here's a whole bunch of people at a revival in China. Here is a normal church service in South Korea. What's his name? Pastor Cho. Cho. Okay. He's got about a thousand people in just in his choir. And then they got a lot more people that are, and that's their regular service. Of course, that's the biggest church in the world, but a lot going on there. Now, here is Pakistan, about a million people. Here's Pakistan again, about a million. Here is India, and about a million people. Here is just a few people. They're in Iraq. Here's a big church in Cairo, Egypt. There's a guy in Cairo. He's a priest, and he's an evangelist, and he speaks Arabic fluently because otherwise they would have cut his tongue out. So he learned how to speak Arabic, and he goes on the satellite and preaches to all the Muslims in their own language. And, of course, they're trying to kill him, but they can't find him because he just preaches up to the satellite, and they can't find him. He says there are hundreds of Muslims turning to Christ every day. Okay, here's a huge auditorium in Australia. Here's more and more, but the thing is, God is moving. Okay, he moved to put our prayer back in the school. It surely wouldn't have happened if it wouldn't hadn't been for the miracles that God did. I believe God is moving all over the world. Eileen and I, Elena, Perkins, and sometimes other people, we go down. You know, the governor says we need to go down to the downtown and pray and everybody take a block. You remember him saying that? It's been close to a year ago. June. June. Okay, so here's Eileen. She said, come on, let's go. I said, okay. So we go down there. We've been going down there twice a week for several months. And so here we are. We come, we hold hands and bow our head and we pray. We've been doing that and people say, oh, there's those church people. And we come up to somebody and say, hey, come on over here. Let's pray together. Okay, well, some of them will turn and run. And some of them, We'll throw their bike on the ground and come on. Okay, here I am. Let's pray. So there, some of them are enthusiastic about praying. And then every time we find somebody to pray with, we give them one of these. This is the greatest story ever told. This is the story of Jesus, his birth, his life, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. This is unbelievable. Have you got some of these, Eileen? We'll give them to you if you want them. And guess what? This thing is in 24 languages. And we get some of these guys and say, well, we want to give you one. Somali, that's us. That's us. He gets excited because it's his language. Okay. And 24 are the most common languages. So that is, is really something. So that's all I got to say. Hi, I'm Dr. Frank Simon. I'm an allergist and family doctor, board certified in both allergy and internal medicine. I specialize in allergy, headaches, sinus, hives, cough, asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. We're located at 1404 Browns Lane near Norton Suburban Hospital. Our phone number is 895-5088. We can see you tomorrow. Okay, we're back. This Jesus DVD, tremendous, and it's in 24 different languages, so it's not only in English. But you can show it to anyone who's Hispanic or Somali. We've given it to several, several Somali people. So the other thing is, there's a lot of, of this business about George Soros. He said, 
destroying America will be the culmination of my life's work. Exactly. George Soros. Here it is for the television audience. The thing is, George Soros and the Muslims are the two aspects of the same thing. The whole purpose is, this is, goes back again to another Arab comment about an enemy of my enemy is my yes. friend. Yes. And while they're using the Muslim as another level to destroy America, and their ultimate goal is to rebuild the world in some kind of a one-world utopia. Yes, which yes. Is supposed, I won't even get into how ridiculous that is in terms of reality. Yeah, the number to call, 895-5025. 895-5025. Now, leave your name, address, phone number, and email address. And this is what you call joining the Christ movement, the Jesus movement, okay? They hate Christianity because they can't make a socialist government, communist government, as long as the Christians are there. As the song says, onward Christian soldiers. We can work together and we can stop these Muslims and the communists and the George Soroses. They're all together. They all feed each other. They send money to each other. They all work together, so we've got to work together to overcome all of this. So if you will send us your name, address, phone number, and email address by calling that number, 895-5025, and we can send you the Jesus movie, we can send you this material on George Soros, we can send you the booklet on Muslim Brotherhood, where they admit in their own words that what they're trying to do is to take over the American government. And everybody knows it except Obama, and he knows it too, but he's not letting on. There's a lot of dangers, and we need everybody. Is that right? Exactly, because one of the things, let me change the focus a second, to illustrate what you've been saying, is, for example, North Korea. Yeah. And North Korea has been supported by Islam, by Iran, with with funds and everything else, and with the technical knowledge of how to build a bomb. And all of the nuclear information, everything else, has been coming out of Iran. Right. And all of these things are tied together because Iran is trying, they're leading this thing. They've been supporting Hamas all of the different organizations that are trying to destroy the world. Right. And Trump is the first person who has taken a hard look at all of this and is doing the right thing yes. in terms of putting the illustration of what they're really up to in proper focus. Filling the beans on them. So, so when you look at what other things that are going on, like everybody's concerned about North Korea, whether they're going to bomb this or they're going to do that, and all the other things in the hacking that's going on. Yeah. And one of the things that we have to watch very closely, and this has been written about several different ways, is that the impact on our electrical grid. Yeah. They can very quickly destroy that. And then the thing what happened, too, that I, I've been very concerned about is that when the Russia disintegrated, it became yeah. 